All right, good uh, afternoon, or welcome back to another uh, lecture in our series uh, Chaos and Fractal Dynamics, Math uh, 6310. Uh, today, we are going to spend some time talking about the Cole Pitts Oscillator. And uh, after we had our discussion, uh, some of you indicated some interest in the system that is more geared toward electronics, electrical type of things, and, and this is one of those. As I mentioned in our previous lectures, um, um, our chaotic systems are, show themselves in many, many different ways, and as you start thinking about it, it's this balance of nonlinearity uh, that allows you to have variation in behavior, but variation in such a way that uh, is, is bounded within a particular uh, state space, which we'll talk about. And, uh, but it, in, it's arranged in such a way that you have almost infinite variation all compressed into that space. And the only way that you can do that is uh, to have a fractal. And you've seen in the uh, single hump maps that we've talked about before, the um, logistic map, for example, that even with that very simple system, you have this uh, depth and variation of behavior. If you looked at the bifurcation diagram, it was a fractal that you could zoom into and see self-similarity continue uh, to show itself. That's the kind of thing that I'm talking about here. And this happens in uh, other types of systems. So today we're going to talk about electrical oscillator. So the coal pits oscillator is one that was designed essentially to generate a waveform and i'm going to just draw here right a sinusoidal waveform you know kind of like that this is time this is some um, say voltage you know in time that just goes up and down with a certain frequency that is defined by this period tau, meaning where does it start repeating itself again? And the frequency then is equal to one over the period tau. And, uh, you know, there'd be this amplitude. So what it want, you wanted to generate was something that, something like V of T is equal to A sine uh, 2 pi f times t. That would give you this. You would get a, a signal that varies up and down between minus a and a with a period of tau or a frequency of one over tau. How frequent does it repeat itself? And that, now, why do you want that? Well, that's the basis and foundation of all of our communications and things like that. When you see you have a, um, well, you know, I use a radio station as an example. Say you have, uh, <clears throat> you know, something that is, uh, uh, you know, 520, AM, right? Say that's some radio station. Well, that's going to usually be uh, 520 kilohertz is the frequency, uh, so 520,000, and uh, that's the frequency, so the period would be 1 over that. And so it, it, it varies very rapidly. But that is the carrier signal from which all of the information that you hear uh, flows. And it's the same idea um, when you're dealing with, um, it's the same idea uh, for any, our, our digital information age today. 
it's still carried on a carrier signal that's usually something like uh, this sinusoid because it's clean, but you have the information over the top of it or somehow embedded in it. That's how we communicate. So engineers need a stable oscillator that would produce um, a chaotic, I'm sorry, that would produce a sinusoidal oscillation, very clean, you know, without variation. But of course, when you play around with the values, uh, you would get what we would consider chaotic oscillations. And we'll get into that in a second. So that is the background. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the characteristics. We're going to go through a, kind of a gory mathematical exercise here. Uh, just to, and that's what we'll spend most of our time doing today. Um, and I just want you to see it. Now, you asked for this. I mean, the, the, the Lorenz oscillation would have been a little cleaner to work with mathematically, but you asked for this, so we're going to go through it. Um, we're, we'll talk about later as we build this out, the butterfly effect, how it changes, with how uh, small changes, Lyapunov exponent, um, then the Poincaré surface, We'll talk about that, how you can use that to glean information from what you have, and even how that can impact something called synchronization, where, where, where chaotic oscillations tend to mimic behavior of others. Then you can real further even show how you can control it, control chaos to make it do what you want it to do, and even further symbolic dynamics, something I explored called synchrodyne amplification and even image processing. I'm going to go through all of that before this course is over. This is how we're going to build this out. But we'll use this coal pits oscillator as the basis and the foundation for everything that we talk about. And that way we won't be bouncing around with ideas. We'll stick with this. Okay, so um, here are the uh here's the circuit diagram and here are the equations of motion now this is a uh, you know one of the typical oscillators uh, it, it's it's used in engineering as i mentioned and is, is also very simple to build it and test it which i've done in the past uh now so you have this current that flows called i l the current through the inductor. The inductor is L. Okay? Then you have, and, and for a transistor, and that's the, the key element here, this Q is a transistor, and that's where the nonlinearity comes in. Let me, let me just go over to this equation for a second. Um, you don't see any places of nonlinearity either in uh, the current that's here, the voltage uh, E or VC, you don't see uh, anything nonlinear, right? They're not multiplied with each other. They're not squared or one over. The nonlinearity is housed primarily in this expression here, which is the expression for the transistor. And the transistor is, is an object that you know, has it, 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 it changes with regard to the voltage or current through it or the voltage across it. So it has something called an emitter. I'm going to call it E. Nope, I'm, I'm wrong. That's, that, that's wrong. That's the collector. That's a collector. This is the emitter. And then back here is the base. So three prongs of a transistor, collector, base, and emitter. So the voltage across C is called the collector voltage. Uh, the voltage here is the emitter voltage. And this is how the circuit is constructed. So, so those are the three items that, that are independent of each other. This, this current right here, this voltage VC, and this voltage V sub E. Everything else is dependent on each other. So if you can independently find those uh, parameters, then you can get the state of your system. 
meaning you can know everything you need to know about it. That's the state. All right, well, what does it look like if you uh, uh, either build it and, and run it or you solve these set of equations, you get something that will look like this. And as the inductor current flows, the, 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 uh, the inductor current flows, the emitter current or the collector voltage, the emitter voltage or the collector voltage. So any point on this system will give you a I sub L at some time T, you'll get a VC at some time T, and you get a VE at some time T. And that's what you have at any point in time you can trace what's going on. So as you can see, it's bound by um, this volume of space, right? You know, from here, and here's a you know maximum over here and here. So this volume of space is is contains everything that happens. But as you go deeper and deeper into it, you'll see that there's a lot of variation in the behavior. So. Um, you take a look at this. Th these are the time-dependent waveforms. Um, and here's what the current through that inductor looks like at any given time. Uh, this is the uh, voltage across the emitter and uh, the voltage across the collector. Now, you may look at those waveforms and say, oh, they look like something, right? Look like something. And I'll, later on, I'll show you how I use that notion to do some other things. But some of you may say that kind of looks like EKG, right? Um, or maybe it looks like sound waves or something, right? You, you may recognize it intuitively. But uh, so there are things you can do with that. But what I will note is that they don't look like a nice clean sinusoid. So if I go back to this, and if this was a nice clean sinusoid, all you would see um, is a one circle or, or oval that moves around in this state space. But that's not what you see. You see all these variations that happen and they go up and down and back and forth and what they look like together is kind of interesting all right it also brings up the notion of initial conditions right so if i like like this line shows right here um here here and here are the initial conditions, or can be a set of initial conditions. So at any point in time, these are the, the values, and you can start there or whatever, right? So that's just this notion of initial conditions. And then it, it create, if you start exactly at that point, you know that you're going to get this type of behavior going forward. But you have to be very, very, very exact, because if you remember, um, small changes start to amplify very quickly. So if you want it to exactly perform this behavior, you have to be very exact. Any small change or difference will make this, this waveform here, for example, look a lot different uh, than what it does. So that is the notion of, you know, this initial condition so say you're starting here and you move along this right and here's where you end up after some point in time and then if you have a, a similar starting point but not quite so there's this delta uh delta um i l delta V uh, uh, E and delta V C between there, then you let that run in time. And at the end of that time, let's say, you know, T final, 
So this is at T this is at T zero. You're going to have a different delta. Let's just call it delta zero and delta final. And that's going to be, you know, delta I L final delta uh, V E final and delta uh, V C final. And so, you know, your Lyapunov exponent then is related to, um, you know, the, the, the log, the log, natural log of uh, delta final over delta um, zero, right? So that's what we talked about before. Same thing applies. Same thing applies. All right. So here's a specific example, and I ran this with MATLAB, and I'm going to get, let, uh, eventually I'll let you uh, have these and play with it and show yourself. And here's the values of each of the parameters of this, of this circuit. Um, and these are directly related to, you know, these equations. Okay, so, um, well, let me, let me do, do this right quick. Let me just grab a copy of this equation and bring it over here. Move it so you can see it. I guess that's good enough. All right, so, so you know, as you can see, this is C and CE, which goes for these two. Uh, R sub E uh, right there. Uh, alpha, which is the parameter inside of the transistor element. Uh, uh, beta, which is also transistor element uh, expression, then VCC. V E E L R sub L R uh, the delta the, the time step that's another thing and then the initial condition so we use all of that and integrate forward from this initial condition so this is where we start and this is um, you know V uh, I L uh, V um, uh, uh, E and V C this is the starting point here and again integrate forward for some number of time steps and this is what you get now notice it wheels around this kind of hole in space and if you looked at this kind of from this from each vantage point so one you might be looking top down uh, looking according to you know across this way uh, you know, using it kind of looking from the vantage point of the inductor current over here or the emitter. And th this is just how it looks like. Yeah, so it's going to vi visualize it in space. Uh, for example, this one over here, this is the, in this is the inductor current I sub L. This is uh, VE. Uh, this is I sub L and VC. And this is uh, VC versus... Uh, uh, no, V, yeah, VC versus um, VE. And that's what it looks like. And you see this, so I wanted you to focus on this, these, this hole that's here, because it's, it's kind of what it all circulates around, and they want to probably right there. This is what, what it kind of winds around, and we want to see if we can't figure out what that is, what that point is. Uh, and then we'll try to actually, at some point later, we'll plug the numbers in and see if it actually is that point. Because that's important later as we figure out our point array surfaces, and I'll, we'll talk about that much more later. Okay, so um, let's try to take a look at this. Now, <clears throat> Here are, the, here are the equations. Now, what, what I want you to understand is that if you look at this, 
especially this DIL, DT, DV, DT, DVC, DT, these are uh, velocity equations. I mean, if, you know, uh, for example, uh, velocity, I'll use another V, is DX, DT, the change in X versus time, and the same thing, uh, uh, acceleration is dv dt, which is equal to the second derivative of position and time, right? Second derivative. All right, so just, just keep that in mind. That's just, just, these are velocities. So if we want to know, these points around, around here are where the velocity goes to zero. And it gets very slow as it winds around slowly. As you get into the middle, it's almost like a black hole, nothing escapes. But um, it's, 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 it's the velocity zero. So we're gonna so try to solve this for by setting these expressions equal to zero. Okay? That's what we're going to try to do and see what we come up with. So let's start with this first one. Um, we call it 1, 2, and 3. So we have uh, VCC minus VC, so that's the varying parameter there, minus R plus RL times I sub L equals zero. Okay. So let's, let's, you know, take a easy way out and just solve it for VC. So this has V sub C is equal to, we're just going to move that over uh, to the zero and that make it easy. So that'll be VCC minus R plus RL times i sub l. So that's, that's what we are, are going to kind of first walk away with. Simple relationship between vc and i sub l. All right, so next, um, let's look at uh, the num equation number two. Uh, that says uh, i sub l minus V sub E minus V E E over R E equals zero. And now we can get a relationship um, that says um, I sub L is just equal to V E minus V E E over R sub E, right? So it's all just, just algebra, no, no big, you know, deal. All right, so we got that as well. So we're kind of establishing the relationships between each of these. You see a V E in there, you see a V C, you see I L. Uh, how are they all connected together? Now, we have to deal with this, with um, the crazy thing in there, because what I want to make sure I didn't escape was um, this part as well, the relationship with I C. So let me go down and make sure that doesn't get lost because that's the thing that makes everything work and make everything tricky as well. Okay, so we have um, now let's, let's take a look at this equation number three. Um, first of all, remember we were setting D, E, D, T equal to zero, so this goes to zero, as does this whole expression, if you remember. So this basically is saying that 
I sub I sub L, this thing's acting funny, uh, minus IC equals zero, or uh, I sub L equals I sub C, which is gamma times E to the minus alpha V E minus one. All right. So again, we got this, you know, kind of funny relationship between I sub L and V sub B. And we got to work that out. Otherwise, we won't really be able to do much of anything else. All right. So um, if we go back to one of the things that we had, if you look uh, back here, uh, on slide nine, you see this, I sub L is equal to VE minus VEE -E over RE. So we're gonna use that. So, um, so then that means that gamma times E minus alpha VE minus one is gonna be equal to uh, v e minus v e e over r e, okay? Because you know, going back, that's what we figured out. I sub l was equal to. So since I sub l equals I c, this is I c, and this is this is I sub c right here, and and this is. I sub L right there. Now we have it all in, in terms of VE, so if we could somehow figure out what VE uh, is, then, then we would now can have that, and then we can go back, plug it back in and everywhere else, and we'll have uh, some sort of expression. But unfortunately, it's not all that simple. So let's just, let's just uh, kind of uh, make this nicer. Um, this is gamma uh, e to the minus alpha v e minus gamma equals v e over r e minus v e e over r e. Okay, that's what we got. So I'm just trying to bring everything together. Uh, so let's go to the next thing. Um, so I'm going to say uh, gamma e to the alpha minus alpha v e. All right, I'm going to bring that over here. So that'll be minus v e over r e. Take that over there and say that's equal to gamma uh, minus VEE -E over RE, okay? Everybody okay with that? So, I wanna, what I'm trying to do is bring this together to create something called a, um, a Lambert function, and I want to cast it in the end up cast it in the form of y e to the y, right? That's that's what I'm trying to get to. And Lambert um, function, they use w here, but it's the same idea. And I, I'll put this link in the slides. Um, it's a solution for this function w times e to the w. It's not, it doesn't have a simple analytic solution that you can pull out, and um, this was used in a lot of different things. I think Einstein used this to try to solve uh, certain types of uh, uh, gravitational equations, as you can probably imagine. You see how, the, how it, uh, yeah, uh, infinite series of, uh, that he was trying to solve. Um, but anyway, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, they end up coming up with solutions of transcendental type functions like this. Um, and um, 
we just use it and, and, and can perhaps uh, just plug in values to the solutions. Uh, and that's where I wanted to get this. So, so what I'm trying to do is cast uh, this <coughs> in the form uh, to make these values, uh, make this V sub E be, be uh, multiplied by, by that. Because right now you've got this V sub E and that V sub E. And um, help me. All right, let, let, let's do this. I'm, I'm going to say uh, gamma e to the minus alpha v sub e um, equals v sub e over r sub e um, plus gamma minus v e e uh, r sub e. Okay, now, all right, yeah, all right, here we go. All right, so, so uh, if I let, um, because this, this, is a, this is a constant, let's just call that A, um, and this is a constant, so we could, that one over R is a constant. Um, so this is equal to V sub E over R sub B plus uh, A. Uh, so now if I let that equal to Y, so Y equals V sub E over R sub E plus A, I let that equal to Y, then um, Y, uh, then uh, V sub E, would be uh, y minus a uh, times r e. Okay, yeah. Okay, so now now I can go up back to this. Um, all right. So let's let's keep that in mind. So now I can go back to. Um, gamma e to the minus alpha v e is times y minus a over uh, times r e. All right. Now, um, this is going to be uh, gamma e to the minus alpha y um, times e to the minus, oh sorry, there's, a, there's also a, a r e, minus uh, e to the minus a alpha times r e. The point where I'm trying to do is make that into something, and this is another constant, so let's call that b. Um, now you got gamma e to the uh, uh, gamma times b uh, e to the minus alpha y is equal to um, Oh, to the whole thing I did over there, which was um, V E over R E plus, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, all right, all right. I let that whole thing equal to Y, right? So that's equal to, that's equal to Y. And then I can move that over and say, let's just say y e to the alpha y, now because I moved it over there, it changed the sign, um, is equal to um, uh, b 
speed times gamma. All right. Okay, now that is now, so this uh, y e to the alpha y equal to b times gamma, this now is in the form of a, of a, a, a Lambert function, which you can then go in and find it on a table or, or in some, some programs actually plug that in. But the point is that you can find out what it is. I went through all of that just to show you how it gets weird uh, to figure out exactly where these, uh, this center remains because it moves dependent upon the, these parameter values. And as you can see, well, gamma, I think it's, it's related to this beta. This is the alpha that we talked about. Uh, and then these other things, even VE and all these other things are kind of embedded into uh, that alpha and Y and all that stuff that we talked about. So this will move depending upon those uh, parameters. This isn't in some set position. It depends on what those things are. But once you know, you can go in and figure out exactly what it is. And we'll try to do that with MATLAB and show you. So sorry for all the uh, confusion and delay and all that stuff, but uh, you know, got it to where you can fast forward through all the homina hominas that I did and, uh, and just get to the, to the meat of it. And um, there you go, okay? So um, that's, uh, that's what we'll, we'll, we'll end this today. As I said, I wanted to go back and uh, I want to continue to go through so, and, and do all this. So, so next time, I'm going to actually bring you know, more of the MATLAB uh, analysis stuff. And I also will share with you that and let you then go through and generate and, 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 and create and do some things. Uh, and that may even be part of the assignment that I give you is to use MATLAB to figure out point gray surfaces, show and calculate the Lyapunov exponent for different regions, uh, things like that. Then eventually we get to where it synchronizes and we talk about controlling chaos and the other stuff, okay? All right, well, thank you for your indulgence and your patience. Uh, we'll continue uh, to do this uh, as we go forward in this course, but I'm enjoying it so far. I hope you are too. And uh, that's it for today.